Hello and welcome to The Daily Friend Show. I'm your host, Nicholas Lorimer, and today we have a slightly special episode of The Daily Friend Show uh, with a very specific focus, but we'll get on to that in a second. Let me first introduce my guests, and uh, we are, of course, joined by the, the CEO of the IRR, uh, Mr. Dr. Franz Cronier. Franz, how are you doing? Very well, Nick, and you, and it's great to be back. Yes, it's very good to have you back on the show for the new year. And of course, we are also joined by the Chief of Staff of the IRR, Mr. John Endress. John, how are you? Very well, thanks for having me. And you might hear there's a patter of rain on the roof. Very welcome rain, uh, but we won't let that get in the way of the conversation. Indeed. Um, the, that also goes for me. I'm also being beset by storms, uh, but hopefully it's nothing too terrible. Okay, uh, so today our episode is going to be focusing on one of the biggest issues facing South Africa at the moment, and that is, of course, expropriation without compensation, which is a program of action by some in government, by government to essentially destroy property rights as we know them in South Africa. Um, the IRR has been fighting very hard against this for a while, and um, since we've got you know two of our, our heavy hitters on the show today, we're just going to talk a little bit about where 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 this issue is and what the IRR is doing about it, and also possibly what you can do to help this fight. So, uh, France, let me start with you and say, why is expropriation without compensation, or EWC, as we tend to call it, uh, such a priority for the IRR? Yeah, Nick, uh, hi. Yeah, I think sometimes people say to me, what do, what do you do? Which is a very good question. I thought, let's use half an hour to... To give people some insights, some operational insights into into IRR activities, and we'll go quite deep and quite uh, in, in some detail into this. We run projects in addition to many other things, and some of our projects are geared at at changing the climate of opinion with a view to shifting policies in South Africa. And we run some pretty big ones. So one is on shifting away from BE towards non-racial policy, but perhaps the biggest single project of uh, the past several years has been that against expropriation without compensation. And the reason why it's such a priority for us is twofold. First reason is, is that the, the future of our democracy hinges on the results here. Uh, if you want to be a fundamentally free and open society, one in which people are free to think and do and say and act as they please without harming their neighbours, Property rights must be secured. And the reason for that is practical. But a government that cannot mess with the property rights of its citizens cannot push them around and intimidate them in, in other ways. Lose on property rights, and South Africa will lose on civil rights. It's, a, it's, it's like night follows day. It's a certainty, and the whole constitutional edifice is on the line here. The second reason related to the first is economic that if South Africa goes ahead and implements on expropriation and begins seizing assets, we'll talk about what those would be uh, in the next half an hour or so, the effect will be to, to uh, attach a red flashing light to South Africa's investment door, and the country will never attract the capital. It's a capital-hungry country never attract the capital, foreign or domestic, investment in other words, necessary to get the, the rate of growth up to a point at which the economy is able to, through job creation and the like, fundamentally improve the lives of its citizens. So if EWC goes ahead, you, you, you condemn literally millions of South Africans to a long-term future of poverty and desperation. They'll then, of course, Nick, become very ab upset at this state of affairs, and their anger will be harnessed by the populist politicians to erode the constitutional edifice, and e expropriation on its own, therefore takes South Africa to a place where the economy is shot later on, and, and uh, the democratic uh, breakthroughs of 30 years ago are lost. That's very concerning indeed. So, John, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think those were exactly the, the two points that I would have started with as well, um, the, the social, democratic, and economic. Um, I would add to that that the, the reason we are so worked up about property rights is that this is not a topic that you can dabble with. In other words, it's not something where you can try reducing them a little bit and try a little bit of expropriation uh, you know, and, and mess with property rights in a fundamental way uh, without paying the consequences. And those consequences are not just short-term, but also very long-term. 
because they go together with a loss of credibility on the part of government. And to illustrate this, just think of Zimbabwe, which started with uh, meddling with property rights in the early 2000s um, and never recovered from that. Um, and the reason for that is that even if today the government of Zimbabwe were to come out and say, from tomorrow, we are guaranteeing property rights. You have nothing to fear. You have nothing to worry about. Nobody would believe them and they would be right not to believe them. And therefore, you know, we, we see this as a sort of one way road that we're heading down at the moment from which it is very, very difficult to come back. And that is why we're trying to prevent the country from heading down that road in the first place. That's like pregnancy, Nick, property rights. <laughs> you, you are or you're not. You, you don't, you're not a little bit pregnant. And you don't have a few property rights, but at other times you don't. And what's great about John, John's also got Venezuelan experience, which is a rare thing in, in this field. And uh, I mean, what in talking to him since he's joined us, the, 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 the narratives, the policy steps that are being followed here uh, echo quite closely uh, what happened in Venezuela when that society sort of stepped off the brink and, and collapsed into a morass of terrible horrors, John. Correct. Um, and it, it also transforms <clears throat> all economic planning into short-term economic planning. So in other words, uh, as, as a Venezuelan at the moment wanting to invest or wanting to run a business, you can't make long-term plans. You know, you'll try to, to get as much profit as quickly as possible on whatever activity you can do, but you're not going to you know, build a business that will prosper over a period of 20 years because you might not have it two years from now if it gets expropriated. So for, your, for you to be able to have a time horizon to work on, uh, to, to generate assets, to generate production, to generate wealth, you need the security of property rights. When they are curtailed, then that time horizon becomes very short and it distorts the kinds of economic activity that go on in an economy and it makes it ultimately very unproductive. That's very concerning. The more I hear about Venezuela, the more my sort of blood turns to ice in my veins because it seems very uh, familiar. Um, Let's let me just briefly go down a little side road here because I think we do need to sort of talk about this. And this is what our opponents say about our efforts to oppose EWC. They'll say, you know, we're simply protecting uh, white privilege. We're preventing urgently needed land reform, without which, as Julius Malema said, there will be uh, slaughter and genocide and all sorts of terrible things if we don't have land reform. Why are they wrong? Well, it's crap, Nick. The, they, they're wrong in, in every respect. What uh, needs to happen here if South Africa is going to become a prosperous and middle-class society is that uh, black South Africans need to be afforded. Let's just talk about agriculture, then we'll go into why this is happening later. Black South Africans need to be afforded the same advantages that white South African farmers have enjoyed over a very long period of time. And in the main, those advantages were, were threefold. One was access to cheap capital. And we, we're strong on that for black farmers. The second is very strong support services and extension services. Now, the state's been hollowed out. It can't do that anymore, but the private sector certainly can. And the third and the most critical ingredient is title. The ability, the right to say, this is mine. I own it. The black farmer sitting on his own stoop, title deed in his hand, farming away. That's not, nothing less will, will suffice. And that's a perfectly uh, uh, feasible objective for the country uh, to reach. And that is the objective that the IRR has campaigned and lobbied for uh, in one form or another throughout its very long and distinguished history. So this, this is, in, in fact, it's the, 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 the critics get it precisely and perfectly wrong. The expropriation policy as proposed by the government will assure. Uh, uh, that South Africa remains a country in which black South Africans are excluded from meaningful participation in the, in the economy and uh, live lives of dependency and poverty. It is only by extending property rights to more people and strengthening those rights that you attract the growth and investment that will allow more South Africans to accumulate wealth and assets. The Institute's objective is is very much that it has never changed, not for almost 100 years. That's how long we've been around, just short of that. And that is exactly what it remains. On this issue of, uh, John, let me go to you, on the issue of land hunger, why is, is this an overblown idea? 
I think it is a very emotional idea. Um, and I think it is one that lends itself to emotional expl exploitation by politicians. Um, but I think ultimately the question that needs to be answered by South Africa is uh, how to move on to a tra trajectory of economic growth and prosperity. It, the, the land in itself isn't that important. What is important is that people become wealthier, that they're able to build up assets, productive assets, businesses, and so on over time, which will generate the resources that allow them to buy land or buy other assets as they choose. Um, so I think it is a it is a misdirection to think that land is you know the the all dominating core issue that you know that has to be resolved at any cost. I think it is important um, you know because great injustices were committed in the past and they must be rectified. Um, but at the same time, ultimately, what we need is to have people who are able to live their lives freely in a self determined way and have the economic resources to do that. Uh, and for that, you need property rights not just in the area of land but across the board across all asset classes. Now we hold the information in answer to your question, Nick, that polling shows that there is not significant political demand for land in South Africa. If you ask South Africans, what do you want? What's important to you? What will improve your life? The answers are, I want to go to a city and get a job, run a business, put my kids in good schools. Exactly, as, 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 as would happen in any uh, advancing society. We're not, there's no yearning to go and be kind of living as a rural peasant. In fact, in fact, I can tell you from that polling, that middle class people, the sort of people that live in Parkhurst and work as sociology professors, think land <laughs> reform is a greater policy priority for the country than than rural black South Africans who understand what it means. They, they just wish they could go to Parkhurst and become a sociology professor in a, in the <laughs> university. And I can tell you further, I dare them to deny it, that ANC polls uh, asked what opinion surveys, what, what do you want the ANC to do for you? And ANC members, uh, land reform was 13th on their list of what they wanted the party to do. Now, you as a listener of this program, list the 13 things you want the ANC to do for you. You'll start running out of things at number five or six. 13, it's not a major issue. There's no mass demand for land. If land isn't redistributed, the country won't collapse into a morass of revolution. That's fear-mongering nonsense. Um uh, uh, what, what if we do collapse into such a morass, it will probably be in part because we pursued expropriation and did never met the expectations of people. Now, listen to what comes next. That does not mean we think that this is an unimportant issue or one that should not be addressed. And the historical dispossession of people must be. If you lost land in South Africa as a consequence of the racist policies of the past government, you deserve to be compensated. But that compensation is a societal good. It does not have to be paid by the individual who happens to own now, decades later, a productive business that he has bought and paid for through the market. If it has to be financed, it must be financed through, through taxpayers. There are other avenues as well that we have proposed. Sometimes ignorant people say, oh, you say nothing, no lad. It's nonsense. That's not what we've said. We've got great ideas. One of them, for example, and then I don't want to get too much into the ideas. I'm going to go on with this, is that uh, is, is financing and access to capital. That if you're a 100% black farmer, you can borrow from the land bank, which is now in a mess because it's managed so badly, at 0%. If you're a 50-50 black-white partnership, you can borrow at half the commercial lending rate. And if you're an established white commercial farmer, you can borrow at the commercial rate. What that would do at once is that a great number of white commercial farmers would run around looking for partners with which they could buy new farms and start new businesses. And, and within a very short period of time, this, the, the, the agricultural climate would, would be transformed, not by eroding property rights, but by strengthening those rights and by addressing past wrongs. So this thing can be dealt with, even if it is a critical political issue, much better ways than, than by going through expropriation. So if expropriation isn't really needed or, or isn't, isn't needed, isn't uh, demanded by people, where does EWC come from? Why why is it coming out of the ANC, the SACP, the, the EFF? From the ANC's perspective, for very good reasons. Uh, one is that the party is running out of money. 
that it needs to govern the country. The deficit debt levels are at alarming highs. The, the deficit now, the difference between what the government spends and earns, is at a level that the country last saw in the aftermath of the Rubicon speech when apartheid was collapsing, and before that, the Second and First World Wars. And this in an era of global economic recovery. So they've run out of money. They don't want to borrow money from the IMF because they'll lose sovereignty. They don't want to print yet because they're a bit nervous about the consequences of what that would be. But there are large pots of money in the country in, in uh, uh, health insurance, product savings and pensions, etc. And the expropriation drive for some ANC leaders is a, a foil, a land expropriation, to backstop future prescribed assets policies. Because there is no such thing like the land reform bill. The business media reports on a land reform bill. There is no such uh, legislation. There's only an expropriation bill. And the expropriation bill allows the seizure of any fixed or movable assets. That includes uh, your house. It includes your vehicle. It includes your savings. It includes your pension fund, your medical aid, and shareholdings in companies. That's where this thing is going. So it's not a land reform measure, number one. Number two, others in the ANC appreciate where they headed. Uh, we've just polled the ANC now in, in a few weeks ago. National support at 49%. They're going to lose an election, and they know it. And as happened uh, in our northern neighbor and in many case studies uh, before that, the, the, the more, uh, uh, what would you call it, malevolent, the ANC's leadership appreciates that a point is going to come if things carry on like they are and we remain a fundamentally free society where the ANC will not have a national majority. And that could happen as early as 2024. So via the erosion of property rights, they set the scene for the erosion of the rule of law exactly as has played out before and taking you back to my opening comments on why this is not a land reform question. It's not even just an economic question. It is the fundamental question about whether South Africa survives as a free and open society to the end of this decade. Boring indeed. John, what do you have to add? Um, uh, I would add that these policies which capture our attention at short notice and that we then forget about when the next scandal breaks, um, <clears throat> must be seen in a, in a much longer term context, in a, in a much bigger picture, I think. Um, so expropriation without compensation, uh, you know, raises the hackles, for example, of farmers. Uh, and the rest of the country thinks, you know, you don't have to worry about it because this is some isolated people somewhere that might be affected, possibly. But I think what's really happening is that the, the ANC does have a, a goal that it is working towards over time which is to convert South Africa into a more socialist society where the government holds greater sway mm -hmm. over the economy and over citizens as well. And this is a goal that the ANC uh, pursues with great perseverance and great patience. Mm -hmm. And I think we must be aware that when we see blips, we see uh, things coming up that outrage us. Often these things are part of a very big picture and a very long-term process. And I think the, the response to those developments also has to be long-term. So I think you've done an excellent job of laying out exactly the stakes here and, and why this is happening. Um, but but France, what uh, what can we do? What should society be doing to stop this? Yeah, what do you do? Yeah, okay, I'm going to talk to you about about something we call battle of ideas theory. We've practiced it throughout our history, and the idea is that the winner of any great policy or ideological contestation, which is what this is, is ultimately the side that injected the greatest volume of compelling argument into the public mind. This is why uh, fascist dictatorships shoot um, intellectuals and burn books, because they know how dangerous it is when alternative ideas, such as those we've cast around here, that actually you can address historical dispossession by extending property rights, not reducing them. If you reduce them, you actually punish the original victims, and it's quite easy to finance land reform, and there's in any event no mass demand for land reform. It's very dangerous for the political leadership that that idea gains traction. So our uh, uh, strategy is to make sure that it does gain traction. And we've done that throughout our history, whether it was in opposition to, to the Group Areas Act or whether it was in opposition to whatever it is, present examples, race-based policy and, and the like. The winner is the side that puts the greatest volume of argument into the public domain in front of people. Public policy 
is ultimately determined by public opinion, even in uh, closed societies. In democratic societies, it's, it's quite quick to do that. But even in fundamentally closed societies, ultimately public opinion determines the political outcomes. So we try and sway that opinion. Other activists go too early. They try and go and change the policy itself. They go and talk to the minister and say, listen, minister, this is totally ridiculous. Never get any investment if you do this. If you don't change the climate of opinion initially so that the minister feels under pressure to change this because the mainstream business, the media, society, civil society, churches, academics begin to press against it, you're not going to change. The minister might concede. Many in the ANC do. They don't think this will work. They, they, it's a terrible idea. But they'll proceed with it regardless because there, there are other things at stake, prescription and destroying the democracy. So you shift that. In the case of, of, of let's get into some of the detail, what do we actually do? In, in the case of expropriation, we've, we built a, a lobby. Lobbies run by a team of staff, and every morning they move through every uh, comment made about South Africa that has a mention or implication for property rights. If a very compelling argument is made that property rights should be removed because they underpin poverty or cause poverty or re removing property rights will attract investment, and, and that was seen by a large number of people, and was perhaps quite cleverly worded, even, even though it was nonsense, we will respond to it on that same platform. And we do so, and we've done so, with growing, really over the last three years with great intensity, to the point that we start developing air superiority, we call it in the media. And if you think back to sort of 2018, Ramaphosa's been elected ANC leader. The ANC's just bought into expropriation in a big way. There was a vast amount of crap again written about this is great, this will bring justice to society, it will bring growth, we'll, we'll do expropriation in a way that doesn't remove investment. A lot of that has been pushed out of the mainstream thereafter, and opinions have become much more guarded, much more careful, even amongst uh, the more left in our society. And that is a direct function of the lobby we drove. And we know that because we count the stuff. We actually monitor this media thing very carefully. And our efforts were the single biggest source of anti-EWC information to enter the public domain in South Africa over the past three years. That's tier one. And it's the most essential tier. Command public opinion and shift it, and you will command policy. And as a consequence of those efforts, we know that the ANC put the brakes on from moving to test cases of expropriation of farmers that, that would be used later to open the way to expropriating everything else, including your pension, because of the, 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 the manner in which public opinion has begun to, 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 to raise doubts. That was very good. On top of that, we build a second tier of strategy. And this is direct engagement with policymakers, uh, lawmakers, both in South Africa and around the world. It's a tactic used to great success by the ANC. Go global. I went to America to, to release a report about why uh, what was on the line with expropriation in South Africa, not just for the country but for the interests of the free world, if South Africa, the great bastion of liberty on the continent, lost its way. And a meeting with, with a South African official in Washington at the time, the person said to me, you must be very careful because people take you seriously when you're here and they'll listen to what you say. And I said, well, why do you think we've flown all the way over? And, and that had, had great success, meeting with, with lawmakers, with policymakers, with influencers, with the media, etc. That's the second tier of the strategy. Sometimes there'll be a third tier, which, which might go into, into legal actions and the like, but these are very much secondary for us. And uh, 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 they, in any event, just hold the line. They buy you a bit of time. The lesson is this, Nick. If you cannot actually force a new balance of power that makes it too costly in terms of public opinion for the ANC to move on expropriation, you will not be able to stop them. You'll have temporary victories in the courts, etc. 
for time. You'll try and deal your way out of trouble, but the 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 slow march will continue and persist. You need to change the the climate of opinion, and you need to give the politicians a graceful exit, such as this 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 uh, one example would be this this land bank financing scheme. But there are many others that we've mentioned to you. Now, the the numbers on this, I think, are important. Now, John's has sort of got the numbers. I don't have them in my head. But I, I just want to pause for a minute to talk about just the, the quantum of information and opinion writing that emerged from this initiative over the last two to three years. And I know John has that at his yeah, fingertips. I do. So I'm just looking at my screen, looking it up, because uh, there are a lot of numbers, and I haven't got all of them in my head. Um, but if I'm looking at the at the overall totals, uh, we write opinion pieces, um, we conduct interviews, we count citations in the press, we issue press releases, uh, we use social media like uh, Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. And if you count all of these uh, uh, voices of ours in the in the public debate, then we total over 1,200. Um, last year, it was uh, almost 1,000 mentions uh, for the year. So it's one to two mentions every single day. And if you include the social media, then it's 2,000 or around five mentions per day. So every single day, um, there should be something in the media that says that EWC is a bad idea. And it would be wise for the government to desist from it. I think the, the point that France is making is that the, the really critical aspect is that you have to resist. I think in the absence of resistance, the plans will simply be carried out gradually, slowly, incrementally. And before you know it, you know, you'll have lost your property rights and your democratic freedoms and so on. And it is therefore so important to make a stand, uh, to push back and to show that there is uh, a, a, a group in society which should actually re represent all citizens that stands for property rights and wants them to be preserved and also extended to those who don't have them at the moment. There's one, one point that uh, the director of uh, an allied or, or friendly think tank makes often is that today in South Africa, whites have better property rights than blacks in urban areas. And he says this with reference to RDP houses. You know, so if you get an RDP house from government, there are a lot of restrictions on that and you don't get title. You, know, you can't sell it. You can't let it. You have to live there. Whereas if you're a white person in the suburbs, you want to sell your house, you sell it and you go somewhere else. You know, you're completely free to do that. And it is very unreasonable to withhold this right from, from black people or from anybody in South Africa. And therefore, you know, these, these rights must be extended to everybody and, and held sacrosanct. It's absolutely essential for the, the future and the survival of the country. Definitely. So what can people do? Obviously, there's various organizations and political parties and stuff. But what, Franz, what's in your mind the best way that people... There, 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 there are two things. One is understand what's happening, get a hold of the right information and begin to circulate it. It's the power of ideas, the, the ability to circulate information within your circle of influence. That That's the single most powerful thing you can do. It's also very rewarding in the sense that you'll you'll take back that sense of control that you that you've lost control to politicians and lawmakers who threaten your interests you can take it back secondly is 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 fund this via supporting us in our crowdfunding efforts we run a series of those sometimes at, at, at different levels of, of things. So one is the Friends program, there are many others. There's no great corporate support for what we do here. They're too scared to to back it. Uh, our success has been crowd finance that's ordinary people getting into the game and say, you know what, I hear what these guys are doing. It makes sense. It, it improves my circumstances. It gives the country a shot at becoming a serious place. I'm going to back that too. And th we need vastly more of that to up the, the quantum of output to make sure that we continue to hold the line on expropriation and later, which I have no doubt we can do, actually win this battle. Nick, thank you very much. John, anything to add before we wrap up? Yeah, I think echoing what Franz says, um, the advice is get into the fight. Um, so if you're outside the fight, you'll feel that you don't have control, you don't have anything to add. You're a victim of circumstances and you shouldn't be a victim. You know, Get into the fight, uh, promote the ideas that you consider to be the right ideas and support the organizations that promote those ideas. Um, you know, they, they are in the battle for you, they are in the fight for you. And I think together we can shift the climate of opinion um, as we've started to do already. Um, but with, with more impulse, more emphasis, we can shift it even further. And ultimately, our aim is to make South Africa very successful 
and prosperous nation for everybody that lives here. Um, that's that's what we want, and that's what we're fighting yeah. for. And if you don't do it, Nick, there's no one else that's coming to rescue you. Business isn't going to rescue. The diplomats aren't going to come charging in here. The the institutions that that do this stuff like we do, we depend on you completely for 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 the resources to have the effect that we do. If you want to beat this thing, you've actually got to get into the game yourself. And it's a very empowering thing to do. And if you haven't done that yet, look us up, uh, uh, learn more, get in touch, and, and join us so that we can actually uh, uh, ensure that South Africa will get through this current slump and into the end of this decade be back on track to become the truly great country that its potential dictates it should and uh, you can start um, and helping us out. If you thought this video was interesting, important, uh, please share it on, on any social media. If you're listening to this on audio only, please also, uh, you can share the podcast. Um, also go to our website, ira.org.za and click the join us button um, to get more information there. You can also SMS your name uh, to 32823. Um, or alternatively, you can go to the dailyfriend.co.za where you can see the battle of ideas being waged by the IRR. Um, and uh, and yeah, all of that good opinion there. It's also great fun to read. So thanks very much, everyone, for watching. Uh, thanks to my guests for being on. And uh, it's uh, we shall see you tomorrow for another exciting episode of The Daily Friend. Keep the flag of liberty flying. Cheers, everyone.